For those who are, uh, uh, um, if anybody's watching on Torah anytime or uh, YouTube, so today we're going to have shear. Tomorrow, th uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, there's not going to be shear this week because the, uh, there's going to be a, a, a vacation here, midwinter break. So um, we're on Mishpatim, we're on page 416. And uh, the, the, we, we spoke yesterday about the idea of the laws. Now, one of the... Uh, one of the things that you see is that the Torah says, um, and the, there's a connecting vav. So this connecting vav, Rashi says, instead of saying, these are the statutes, it says, so Rashi, the first Rashi says that this vav, if we could close that door over there, that this vav, connects up to the previous Parsha. And Rashi, right at the top, the second line of Rashi says, Mahari shonim misinai, af elu misinai. Just as the first laws came from Sinai, these laws also came from Sinai. Whatever is going to follow in this, in, in this Parsha, and there's going to be a lot of laws in this Parsha. Parsha Mishvati has a lot of laws. And, I, you know, one of the ideas here is to teach you, you know, when you think of Torah, we always think of Torah as, you know, it's very spiritual and it's very, you know, and you grow and that. But, you know, you to get to some of these laws, you're talking about monetary law. You're talking about the, the litigation where two people come to Bayesden. And you get some of, the, some of the, 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 the worst forms of human behavior is when you get to monetary litigation. You know? And so, so I heard Rabbi Rachman once mentioned that part of the idea over here, the reason it's connecting it up is don't think that, you know, Torah, all the laws of Torah are just hunky-dory and everything is sweet. And, uh, you know, these laws also come from Torah. Litigation about, you know, a guy damaged, his ox damaged you, you poked out somebody's eye, you know, all these things, that's Torah. That's also part of Torah. But there's nothing in human behavior that Torah doesn't govern. Uh, how people behave in when they go to Din Torah, how people behave in litigation, you know, money brings out the best in people. I think I once told you the word money, kesef. Kesef is made up of three letters, made up of a chaf, which is really a kaf. Kaf means the palm of a hand. A samach is round, which represents the skull, and a pay is a mouth. That means that in speech, thought, and action, we are very focused on, on kesef, on money. And when, 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 when it comes to money, people get very, very touchy when it comes to money. Uh, not only that, the word kesef comes from the word uh, when Lavan says to Yaakov Avinu, if you remember, yeah, Lavan said to Yaakov Avinu, I see you're yearning to go home. Ki nichsof nichsafta lebeisavicha. You have a yearning to go home. The word kesef is related to the word nichsof nichsafta. That means there's a very strong yearning for kesef. Uh, people, people have a, a strong attachment. So it brings out a certain part of a human being. My father always used to say there are two parts to every person. There is that person and there is that same person around money. Right. There are two parts, yeah. and, and, and the person's behavior around money is often not the same behavior anywhere else. That's why the Gemara says if you want to find out who a person really is, there are three ways to test them, bikiso, bikoso, bikaso. That you test the person. If you want to know who a person really is, you check him when it comes to his pocket, his anger, and when he's in his cups, bikoso, when he's, when he's drunk. That's how, that's how you see what the real person is, right? What is he like when he gets angry? What's he like when it comes to money? And what's he like when he gets drunk? Then you get a, a real insight who the person is. Uh, he's a real gentleman. He's a real gentleman until till he's drunk or till he's angry or till, till it comes to, uh, the, 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 to money on the table. So the first law the Torah talks about is kisikne eved ivri. When you buy a Hebrew servant, sheishanim yavod, he should work you for six, six years. Vashvi yitzay lachav shichinam. Now, uh, uh, a Hebrew is servant, you know, this first of all, is called an Eved Ivri. A Hebrew, it, it translates as a Hebrew slave, but he's really not the same as a Canaanite slave. A slave, uh, if the Jewish people would go to war, for example, and they capture the, they, they kill the bad guys and take the rest captives. That's one way you get slaves, or you bought a slave from a Roman or somebody. There are different ways you could buy a non-Jewish slave. A non-Jewish slave is your acquisition, you own him. And the non-Jewish slave has to do anything you tell him to do. You're not allowed to mistreat him, and you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to uh, uh, do anything inhumane. But he has to do anything that you want him to do. A Hebrew slave is somebody who is, like, there's one of two ways of getting a Hebrew. What's translated as a Hebrew slave, we'll see in a moment why the translation is not, is not precise. A man stole, and he can't afford to pay back. 
right? So let's say a Jewish man stole $1,000 and he can't afford to pay back. So what do we do with this guy? Now in secular world, what do you do with him? You throw him in jail where he becomes a, a better criminal. He learns to be a criminal, writes his memoirs, and becomes a multimillionaire. Uh, 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 and then makes it back to jail afterwards again. Right? He ends up in jail again. In Jewish law, we got a better idea. We take this guy, he owes $1,000. So let's say I sell $1,000 from Yaakov, I sell and I haven't got the money to pay. So Bayesden puts out word, you do not put a Jewish man on a slave block like you would put with a non-Jewish slave. Bayesden puts out word that I am for sale. And then anybody who buys me pays $1,000 for me, and now they own me for six years. I belong to them, I have to work for them for six years. You get your $1,000, and I'm Alex's slave now. For six years, I, I'm working for you now. And, and you, ha you have my services. You can't have me do anything degrading. You can't have me carry your towel if you go to the bathhouse. You can't have me polish your shoes. You can't have me do anything that you can do with a regular slave. I can only do skilled labor or something, for example, I could go out and plow the fields for you, or I could build shells for you. Nothing that would look like degrading slave labor for six years. At the end of six years, at the end, by the way, it's, it, it's so, it, it, you have such an obligation to a Hebrew servant that the Gemara says if you've acquired a Hebrew servant, you've acquired a master for yourself. It's like buying a used car. It's like buying a used car. What happens is you acquired me. If you sleep on two pillows, I have to sleep on two pillows. If you have steak at night, I have to eat steak. You can't eat different food than me. You can't have better comfort than me. That's for a Hebrew slave. Now, the non-Jewish slave, it's not like that. You have to feed him, the, you have to, you have to feed him and keep him fed, but now he's not at the same level as you. So it's so much responsibility you have to, even though I've been bought by you, that the Gemara says if you buy a Hebrew servant, if you buy a Hebrew slave, it's as if you've acquired a master for yourself. Okay, number one. Number two, at the end of six years, I'm supposed to go free. At the end of six years, if I choose to stay with you because you're supporting me, you're supporting my wife and my children, and I basically have no concerns in life, no financial concerns in life. It's a fairly decent setup over here. Uh, I don't have any bills to pay, and I, all I got to do is work, and I get fed. It's like living on kibbutz, right? So I decide that I want to stay with you. So then that's when they drill my ear in the, into the door. They drill an ear into the door, and now I am an indent, what they call the indentured slave, and now I serve you for 49 years until the Yeovil year, and then I go free. That's what the Torah says. It's a basic description of the Hebrew servant. Now, one of these strange laws that you find over here is that when the Hebrew servant has been bought, normally a, a Jewish man is not allowed to live with a non-Jewish woman. Here, the Torah says that a, the master can actually give the non-Jewish maidservant to the Jewish slave, and he impregnates her. And when she has children, these children follow the mother, so the children are not Jewish. Now the master owns these children, they become his slaves as well. They become non-Jewish slaves. That's what it says. However, that's only if the Jewish slave is already married. If the Jewish slave is single, then the master is not allowed to give him a non-Jewish maidservant. Right? Almost, almost the opposite of what you would have thought. Now, why is that? Why is it? Let's try to understand what's going on here. Why is that that if the man is, man is married, and, uh, you know, a man stole and he's married, you buy this guy for $1,000, now you could give him your non-Jewish maidservant and he has, to, he has an obligation to impregnate her. He has an obligation to live with her. And that's how one of the ways that he serves you. Whereas if he's single, you can't. If he's single, you can't. Why not? Maybe it's important for him to already have, like, a Jewish wife, and then after that, you can kind of, like... Oh, there are, there are commentators that actually say that, that his first relationship should not be with a non-Jewish woman. There is, there, there, there is an approach like that. What else? Actually, You're right, good. What else? to join the community still at that point? Who? The, the, ma the maid servant. No, uh, no, she, it's only if he frees her. Only if he frees her, he has no obligation to free her. What do you say? What do you say? He has to fulfill the mitzvot of multiplication, not Jewish. Uh, if, uh, but those kids are not Jewish. Those kids are not Jewish. So that's why he has to marry, marry first to a Jew. Okay, that's very much what Alex was saying. They, you know, very much along those lines. It, 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 there's a practical reason. Imagine, you know, if we, it, you know, you put a single guy up on the market, 
Right? Mm -hmm. Then you put a single guy up. Uh, Dylan's on the market now for six years. Anybody want to buy Dylan? Cost you a thousand bucks. What is it going to take you? Room and board. He'll be on hand. He could cook for you. He could. He could. What do you call? He could build your shelves. He could plow your field. He could. Uh, you have a nice strapping yeshiva bucher on your property for six years. What's it going to cost you? Room and board. Why not? What do I, if, if, if you make a calculation, the thousand dollars that I spend or whatever the money is, it's probably going to probably cost efficient. But the halacha is that if he's a married man with a wife and children, so a guy's married and he has a small Jewish family of nine children, uh, who in their right mind is going to want to buy this guy? i got to support him and his wife and children? Who's going to want to get involved with that? Therefore, the Torah says, okay, we're going to create an incentive for you. He can live with your non-Jewish maidservant and produce children for you. Those are slaves. They, the old days where there was, slaves are worth money. And therefore, the Torah creates an incentive for you to want to buy a married man who is, who is what he called? That's what the, that's what the commentaries explain. Okay, now, there's a different point here which I really want to get to. The Gemara in describing, the Gemara in describing the uh, Jewish servant, that's why I say he's not a slave because he can't do things that a slave does. But the, in describing your, his obligations, including he has to work during the day and he has to live with the maidservant at night, the Gomorrah expression, the Gomorrah condition says, a Hebrew, an Eved Ivri, serves his master by day and at night. He works at, by day and he works at night. That's how the Gomorrah puts it. So one of the Hasidic masters, uh, the Nesiva Shalom, one of the contemporary Hasidic masters, he says, this is a, the Gomorrah is alluding to every one of us. The Gomorrah is talking about who is the ultimate Hebrew servant? Who's the ultimate Hebrew servant? All of us. All of us, because we're serving God. The ultimate Hebrew servant is us. And we have to serve God by day and by night. What does that mean? Daytime, we've mentioned in the past, daytime always represents when things are going well. And the stock market is up, you're doing well financially, you feel good physically, your family is well. Everything is going well in life. That's daytime. Nighttime is ordeal. Nighttime is when things are difficult. Nighttime is when things are challenging. A Jew doesn't really feel like serving. He chips are down. His kids are giving him a hard time. The, his finance, he's struggling financially. Somebody in the family is not well. That's nighttime. And a loyal servant serves God during the day, and he serves God at night. That means that during the times when Jews, when, uh, for example, during the Holocaust, where there were Jews who devoted themselves in ridiculous ways during the, during the Holocaust, the, the, you know, the, the Jews were willing to serve God under those circumstances. You know, how can you even wake up in the morning and say, Mo de'ani? You know, we get up every morning and say, Mo de'ani. By the way, we had a guy here who was a, a convert from Italy. He told me one of the things that inspired him to, 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 to investigate Judaism is he got, he got a hold of a, of, of a sitter translated into Italian. This was before he became Jewish. He had a, a sitter that was translated into Italian, and he started looking through the sitter. And one of the first things he saw was Modeani, that it says, you know, get up in the morning, you thank God for his... He said, this is unbelievable. A Jew wakes up in the morning, and the first thing he does is he thanks God. He speaks to God. He was very inspired by that. You wake up in the morning, so most people wake up in the morning and, he, and turn, off, turn off, you know, hit the snooze alarm, go back to sleep, or they curse because it's morning already. You know, they, you know be, a Jew wakes up in the morning and says, Modeani, if I thanks God. Thank you for, how could a guy get up in the Holocaust, get up in the morning and people ask this guy, what, what am I thanking God for, for waking up again in a barracks in the Holocaust? Yeah, Jews did it. And Jews found smuggled in tefillin and Jews did, did everything they could possibly do in order to serve a coach Baruch Hu, even when it was nighttime, even when it's night. That's a loyal servant. That's a loyal servant. So, so there was a, uh, there was a, uh, a, an interesting halachic shayla. There was a guy who, uh, uh, there was a couple who got married. And uh, three months after the marriage, there was an auto accident, and the husband, his brain stem was shattered. And he was in a vegetative state, and he was in the hospital, he was put on a respirator. And the doctor said, you know, it's unpredictable, this could go quickly, it could go indefinitely, don't know how long this is going to last for. So every day the wife would come in, she'd sit with her husband, there's no response, he's on it, his, his, his brain stem is shattered, there's no hope. And uh, this went on. This went on for a while, and after a few months of this, the wife realized that this could be, this could be indefinite. She decided she's going to have to make a light. Now, you understand, she can't marry somebody else because there's nobody to give her a get. See, see Ellen, that's what we're talking about in the Gemara. You know, she's in a, in a, there's nobody to write the get, there's nobody to write a get for her, right? The husband can't write a get, and he has to issue the get. You can't do it by proxy. 
So the husband has to issue the get. So that she's stuck. She's in a state of limbo. So she decided to make a life for herself. And she went to medical school. And once a week, she would come in and sit 10 minutes in the hospital with her husband, and she would leave. And she went to medical school. She graduated medical school. She started working as a doctor. So you can imagine how many years this is going on now. This is going on 8, 10 years, whatever it is. And every day she would come into the hospital. Every once a week she would sit there for 10 minutes and she would leave. There's nothing to do with it. And he's in this vegetarian and respirator and vegetative state. One day she was sitting in the hospital and due to her medical background, she saw that he was going through a heart attack. He was having a heart attack. And she now had a choice. She could either do nothing and let him die and be released from this Gehenna that she's going through. Or she could hit the button for calling, you know, the, 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 the special, what do you call it, button code blue and get the doctors in. And without a moment's hesitation, she hit the button. The doctors came in. They re resuscitated him and kept him alive. So then she went to a halachic authority, Rabbi Yitzhak Zilberstein, who is one of the biggest postkin alive today. And she said to him, uh, um, was I obligated according to halacha to do that? And Rabbi Zilberstein said, the Torah says, don't stand by while your fellow man dies. You know, it doesn't make a difference whether he's... And again, there, there are different, uh, different approaches here. And Allah, I'm just telling you what he told her. He said, you had an obligation to do it, but I could also tell you that nobody whose ancestors did not stand at Har Sinai would have been capable of passing that test. And that means that a Jew serves God even when it's difficult. That's what an Evid is. That's what a true Evid Ivri is. A true Evid, we are an Evid Ivri. It's always easy to be good to people. That's one of the big tests. You know, how am I with people? I can tell if I'm getting enough sleep or not by how my interpersonal relation, am I snapping at people, am I, am I impatient? That means that I'm, I'm, not, I'm not taking care of myself properly, my, my basic needs. I'm not sleeping enough, I'm not eating well. I'm, 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 I'm getting too nervous with it. Sometimes people want to be focused and intense. I want to learn more Torah. I want to deprive myself of sleep and push myself at night. The acid test is how you are with other people. When I feel good, and I've gotten enough sleep, and I, and, and you know, the, and, and, and finances are good. I'm charming. I'm wonderful to everybody. That's, that's that's not hard. Anybody can do that. Everybody's like that. How are you when you're stuck in traffic on a hot day in New York? Yeah, <laughs> and you're just waving to people. Please go ahead and cut me off. Yeah, go go right go right ahead. You know, I'm not worried. You know, please. Yeah, hi. And you just wave. And the guy in front of you, you know, you just wave to him when he when he sticks you at a red light. You know, because he was draying around. Finally, he scooted through the yellow and left you at the at the red light. And you just kind of waved to him. Thank you very much. Yeah, like that, or you make other hand gestures, right? There, there. You know, there. You know. So, so that's a that, that's a very big indication of that's a very big indication. Anybody could when things are going well, traffic is flowing, then we're all friends. You know, but in Los Angeles, one year there were 40 shootings on the highway because of road rage. And that's only because they ran out of bullets. You know, that, that's why I stopped at 40. You know, I, 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 you know, at a certain point, at a certain point, the test is, the test is, so anybody could serve when you feel good. The test is how you serve a coach broke when the chips are down. Okay, let's go on, because uh, hopefully won't, uh, we, it, it, you know, there aren't Hebrew slaves nowadays. But uh, uh, take a look, take a look at um, Pasuk um, 418. 418, Pasuk Vav. Adona Adona This is the guy who opts to stay on. So the, what the Torah says is you take his ear and you drill his ear into the door. Now, why do you drill his ear into the door? What's the idea symbolically of, of, of the, uh, the commentary? Say the ear heard at Har Sinai that we're supposed to be servants to God, and he chose another master. But why, why the door? You drill his ear into the door. So, what's that? Oh, so why do you drill his ear into the door with a mezuzah? You're right, there's a mezuzah on the doorpost. Why do you drill his ear there? What's it got to do with, his, what's it got to do with, drill, with the door drilling? Well, yeah, but right. But why, why, do, why do you have to do that over here? What, uh, what's that got to do with him in drilling his, in drilling his ear? So, so the, well, yeah, okay. Well, it, 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 so, so the Gemara says that, well, his ear heard at Har Sinai that Hashem said that I'm here supposed to be your master and you've willingly taken on another master up till, for, for Yovel, right? What, what do you say? No, because like, uh, he's kind of representing almost like a lower level because he like leaned into like who 
being a slave to someone almost. Right. That's a, that's what the, and therefore the ear. That's why the ear gets trouble. But why in the door? Why specifically on the door? This is a guy. Why would you opt to do it? Why would a guy opt to stay there for so long? The answer is again because this. Why did he steal to begin with? When does a person ever steal? Person steals because he's having struggle. He's struggling financially. Unless, he, unless he's a kleptomaniac. Uh, uh, most people steal because it's a good parnasa. You know, you, you got to make a parnasa. It's either being an accountant, a dentist, or stealing. You know, those are the three options. That's what you major in in college, right? You take you take a course. I I, I personally think I would be a good shoplifter, uh, uh, and and I'm intrigued by pickpocketing. And the whole pickpocketing thing really intrigues me. You know, I, I just think it's 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 really a, it's really something to. You know, I heard actually in France that you know tourists walk around in France, and a guy walks over. And he says, uh, a guy sees the guy spots a tourist, and he walks over and says, by the way, uh, just be careful, there are pickpockets in the, in, in the vicinity. What's the first thing you do Excellent. if you hear that? First thing you do is like this, right? So he's got his buddy who's watching exactly where you put your hand. Right? Next thing you know, your, your wallet is lifted. <laughs> it's brilliant. I was so, I was just so, I, it, it, it's so good. I, you know, guy says, because I know as soon as I hear it, even when the guy told me, so my first reaction is, oh, you know, you're for, you, you touch, uh, you know, you check your wallet. Next thing you know, it's gone. Right, so but you can't do it. You can't do it. So the guy steals because he needs a parnasa. Then he stays after six years. Now, why do we send him to another Jew instead of sending him to jail? Why do we send him to a Jew? Because if you live with a Jew for six years, you learn what it is to work and be a mensch and put your faith in God, and you'll have parnasa. You opt to stay for forty-nine years. You still believe that the door of parnasa is closed to you, and therefore. His ear is drilled into the door. He believes that that door, there's a door that's closed. And a person has to know that that door is never closed. We don't know when it's going to open, but we only know that we have to make our ishtadlis and yudavin and hopefully our kosh rochobi. That's what the Mephoshim say. Okay, now let's go on because you're going to find a lot of halachas over here. There are a couple of specific, specific ones I want to get to, and we don't have time to go through a whole lot of them. The, uh, um, take a look at, um, take a look at, where is it? One second. By the way, how long does he have to wait for that halacha to apply? For which halacha to apply? The one where he has to get his ear drilled. After six years. After six years, if he opts okay, to if, stay. If he waits a single day, does he get his ear drilled? At the point that he's supposed to go free, we tell him to go free, and then the guy declares, no, I want to stay. Okay, what if he comes back after a day? Does he get his ear drilled then? What do you mean if he comes back? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Good question. He doesn't, he doesn't get I hear it. But I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what the laws are for. If he, once he leaves, if he comes back, if he reset the clock, I don't know. Take a look at. Uh, it's a good question. I don't know. Take a look at. Um, where is it? Um, I'm just trying to find the pasuk. One second, I have it here in. Perik Chaf Beis Pasuk Chaf Dalid. Okay, an intriguing idea. 2224, which is on page, uh, page 430. Okay. So the Torah says like this. Im kesef talve, bottom line, bottom line on page 430. Im kesef talve es ami, if you lend money. Now the word im normally means if. In this case, im does not mean if, it means when. Because if somebody asks you for a loan, you have an obligation to give them a loan assuming you could afford it, and assuming it's responsible, and assuming that you've done it responsibly, there's an obligation to lend money. And often lending money is the highest form of chesed. You don't give, lend your money irresponsibly, and it's assuming that, that you have enough to support yourself. But if you really do, you can't, in other words, the Torah is saying you can't not lend money simply because I'm nervous, I don't, want, I don't like lending money. Nobody likes that. Who likes lending money? I'd, like, I'd much rather receive money than lend money. Uh, everybody, who likes lending money? But if you're able to, and the circumstances are proper, then you have an obligation. So the Torah says, Im kesef talve esami, esa when you lend money to a poor man, lo siya lo kenosha, don't be like, oppress uh, him. How does he try? A creditor. Lo sasimun olav neshech. Don't lend with interest. Don't put, but the Torah severe, seriously prohibits interest. Not only that, the Torah says, somebody who habitually lends with interest does not arise at trias habesim. It does not arise at the resurrection of the dead. So somebody who lends with interest does not, does not arise at, at Chiesa Mesim. What's the connection? 
number one. Number two, several questions here. Question one, what's the connection to Trias HaMesim, to resurrect? Why, if you lend with interest, so why don't you, what's it got to do with not coming, coming back? What's it? Question number one. Question number two is that there's an interesting halacha. You're not allowed to lend with interest to a Jew, but you are allowed to lend with interest to a non-Jew. Number three, what's really wrong with lending with interest? The entire world works on interest. And not only that, if you stop thinking about it logically, I'm going to lend you $10,000. What are you going to do with my money? You're obviously going to be making money with my money. Well, if you're making money with my money, that's preventing me from making money with my money. So it's only logical that I'll rent you my money. That's what interest is, is renting your money to somebody else. You want my money, and you're happy to pay me. And you know the halacha is that even if you want to pay me with interest, you can't. The lender cannot lend with interest, and the borrower is not allowed to pay with interest, even if, he, even if he's willing. I said, listen, I'll be happy to pay you interest. I'll pay you 10% interest. I'll pay whatever you want. Just let me have the $10,000 now. And the Torah says it's forbidden. The Torah says you can't do that. Why not? So we we'll take a look at interest. What is, what is, there, there, are, there are different approaches here among the commentaries. One of the ideas of interest is there's the pain you cause to the borrower. A guy borrows with money, you know, every time you borrow with interest. I, I know when I, when I took a mortgage for my kids. So, so, you know, you go to the bank and they talk about rates, you know, it's 3.27. It's just linked to the prime and it's linked to this. You know, I, I just signed. Okay, that sound, sounds good to me. Yeah, sounds reasonable. Uh, faintest idea. They might have been talking to, might have been just talking Japanese. You know, I, uh, okay, yeah, oh, well, that, that sounds good. That's why I always have to make sure I take somebody with me. When, when the first time we had a sign into when my first daughter got married, so my, my, my son-in-law's father uh, graduated at the top of his class in Yale, uh, and uh, I didn't. And he, uh, he, what do you call it? The, uh, I mean, I wasn't top of the class. I was the middle of the class, but it was also, uh, the, uh, you know, so I made sure he was with me. And not only that, he even did a course on mortgages. He took a course on mortgages. So he basically heard what they were saying. Then he explained it to me. And of course, I just, oh, mm, uh -huh, oh okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah where, where do I sign? Right? And where do we go for lunch? I'm hungry. <laughs> that, was, that was basically how it went. To this day, I don't know exactly what happened. So, <laughs> so, 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 so you, you know, you know it, it, what happens is you hear it, you rise, right, and when you lend with money, it's called neshech. Neshech means a bite. It's compared to a being bit by a snake because a snake venom gets in. It doesn't look like very much. But the next thing you know, the body swells up. So sometimes, you know, you're paying a guy with interest. Next thing you know, you're paying a whole pile of money, which you didn't realize how much you're paying. So you're putting the borrower into a compromised position, number one. Number two, it's not good for the lender. Because part of making parnasa is that we rely on a Kodesh Baruch If you're a businessman or if you even work as a job, I have to have faith that a Kodesh Baruch will provide me with my income. When you lend with money, when you lend with interest, so you have very little overhead, all you have to hire is a couple of thugs to go break some kneecaps if people don't pay back on time, and you sit home opening up envelopes stuffed with cash. It's a very, it removes your reliance on a Kodesh Baruch Hu. It removes your, you, don't, you, you stopped relying on God. And therefore the Torah says, it's not good for you, the lender, either. Therefore you, the borrower, can't even pay me back with interest, even if you want to, because what about me? It's not good for me. That's why, we are allowed to lend to a non-Jew with interest. Because what's happened through Jewish history, in other words, when I lend with it to Jews with interest, I'm going to get that money back for sure. And therefore, I take my reliance off of God. What's happened through history when Jews, Jews were limited in jobs that they could, that they could, they could, they, they were certain laws, they couldn't work in many jobs. So all that was left for Jews is to own a tavern, or to be money lenders, Jews are money lenders. So what happened when they lent out too money, when too many people owed them money? Then there was usually a pogrom where they wiped out all the records and killed all the Jews. So it was anything but a sure thing that you're going to be getting your money back. So when they would lend to the non-Jews, then the Jew could go, he's going to put his reliance on a Kodesh Baruch you know, I hope Igor pays me back, you know, it's not, because it's far from a sure thing. And therefore, according to that approach, it has to do with bitachon. When you lend to a Jew, it hurts me because I'm not going to take my faith out of, my faith isn't going to be, I'm going to lose my faith in God. When I lend to non-Jews, so I'm going to be davening like crazy that these guys pay me back. That's one approach. But there's another approach here. The other approach is 
No one in the world sees interest as anything. Every bank works on interest. Every business works on interest. Everybody works. And people are gladly pay interest because we understand that's something we should do. However, there's one relationship where you won't charge interest. Family. Which is? Family. That's correct. If you lend money to your brother, would you charge your brother interest? Would you charge your dad interest? Would you charge your son interest? Nobody's going to like for you. Jewish, Ju I told you, Judaism, we are a family. We are a family. And families lend, in other words, according to this approach, it's not something inherently, it's, it's not that in a, in, a, in a business relationship, it's not inherently wrong. It makes a lot of sense, which is why you could take interest from a non-Jew. He's not part of your family. But when you lend to a Jew who's your family, I mean, how many people, what do you lend to? I had a guy here who actually told me he lent money to his mother and charged him interest, charged her interest. He told me that. guy said, oh, I, I lent money. I was mentioning this uh, talking about years ago. He said to me, oh, yeah, I, uh, I lent my mother money and I charged her interest. I, I, you know what I wanted to do? I just wanted to take him back in the barn and flog him. That's all I wanted to do. There's nothing. I just, you lend your money, you charge your mother, so she should have charged you for changing your diapers? Right, and every time she nursed you, and every time she fed you, and every time she went, she drove you in the carpool, and every time she picked you up from the bay from Little League, she should have charged you for that. Out of your mind, you charge your mother interest. So nobody's going to charge family interest. Therefore, the Torah says to charge your there's a certain in, gross insensitivity to take interest from a Jew, but it's very, very severe. Why don't you arise at Chiasa Why does a Jew lose his port to Chiasa Mason? What do you say? Well, is it akin to like? Um when someone's impoverished, the Gemara compares it to death, and so you're good. To death Excellent. Him. Excellent. The Gemara says a poor man is compared, compared to a dead man. Being poor is like being dead. That's what Gemara says. There are four people who are considered dead, and one of them is a poor man. You refuse to give this poor man life, and therefore you have lost your you've lost your 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 rights to, to life in the world to come. There was actually a story with uh, um, who was the Rav? I think it was Rabbi Akiva Eger, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, there was a man, a Jewish man, who lent with interest. And uh, he lent, and he, he, he lent with, he wouldn't lend anybody with interest, and he was also a miser. He never gave charity. You know, when he did lend, he lent with interest. And eventually this guy died. And the Hevra Kadisha, the members of the burial society, they came to his sons, they said, listen, it's time to pay up. Normally, we charge 250 rubles for burial. Your father should have been given charity. Your father shouldn't have lived with 5,000 rubles for burial. Otherwise, we're going to let the body rot in the sun. They said, hey, you can't do that. We don't know that 5,000 rubles or nothing. So they went to Rabbi Akiva Eger. They were complaining. They said, hey, look at their price gouging us over here. They're charging 20 times as much to bury our father. What, what's going on? So Rabbi Kiva said, let me explain to you. You don't understand. Normally we charge 250 rubles because when a person is buried, essentially it's a rental. We put him in the ground, but there's going to be a resurrection of the dead, and eventually he's going to get up. So his only rental, rental is 250 rubles. But your father lent with interest. He's not going anywhere. This is a full sale. <laughs> he's buying the plot. He's, that's 5,000 rubles, right? That's what Rabbi Kiva Eger said. So personally, I understand it's, very, it's considered one of the worst of errors in the Torah. One of the worst. If it was a choice, let's put it this way. If it was a choice of eating pork, if, I, if, 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 if a guy held a gun to my head and said, eat pork or lend with interest, I would definitely eat the pork. No question about it. So this is what Adam still needs to know about the, uh, about the two men in Tahara. Why is that? Because in Pesach Mason, they're still going to need to... Oh, we're going to need to know a lot of things. We need, about, need to know about Corbanas also. But you understand, it's considered a very, very, very severe... Uh, one of the... Re and by the way, if you, that's why it's such a big mitzvah to lend and why you get more reward for lending. First of all, when you lend money to a poor man, it's an honorable way of letting him get on his feet. When you, when you give a handout, as big a mitzvah as tzedakah is, it's embarrassing for a person to take handouts. You know, you know, nobody wants to have, you, know, you lend somebody money, so then you lend me money, you let, give me a chance. You know, sometimes a guy is, just needs a little bit of cash just to block that hole and get back on his feet. That's a tremendous mitzvah. Tremendous mitzvah to lend him the money, let him get back on his feet. It's an honorable way. And one of the best things you could do in case you want to give the money is lend somebody the money. When he comes back to pay you back, then you say, yeah, no, never mind, just let it go. That's still easier for him because he already had the money in his hands. It's not like having to take it from your hands, number one. Number two, 
Um, there, there's a medrash that said if you put all of life's suffering on one side of the scale, that includes whatever forms of suffering there are, and you put poverty on the other side, poverty outweighs it. The medrash like that. You put all of the suffering on one side and poverty, because poverty is grinding every day, all day, every day. Uh, I, I know a situation where, 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 where the wife is, where a wife has a couple that get along wonderfully, and the wife has lost all respect for her husband because he just cannot manage to pay the bills. And this happens all the time. So your wife doesn't respect you. People don't like you. Every time you're coming to somebody, they walk away because they know that you're either going to be fetching or asking to borrow money or, or that sort of thing. And then you can't afford good medical treatment. You can't afford good food. You can't afford to fix the door that's broken. There are many things that go into it. And so it's considered one of the worst. So if you help a guy out, you get a tremendous reward. On the other hand, it's difficult to part with my money and especially rationally, where now I'm going to give you my money and you're going to be making money on my money and I'm not. Well, that's why we're Jewish and that's why it's such a big Torah and that's why it's such a mitzvah. Yeah, you know, there was a Shiloh, I want to tell you, there was a Shiloh that was asked through Rav Zilberstein. There's a family that was ready to go away for vacation. They're living here in Israel. They're ready to go away for vacation. The family's like, you're going for the week vacation. And then they came to ask him the following Shiloh. There's a widow who lives on the block, and this family is very friendly with the widow, and she's upset that they're going away for a vacation because now she's going to be lonely. So they wanted to know if they should cancel their vacation because this, so this widow shouldn't feel bad. How many times do you think that question is asked in Ireland? How many times are questions like that asked in, in, in Italy? How many times is that question asked in, 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 in Qatar? or Saudi Arabia, and those kinds of questions. Those are Jewish questions. That's a Jewish question. I like that. Hey, halachically, they certainly do not have to cancel their vacation. Halachically. So Rabbi Zilberstein asked his brother-in-law, Rav Chaim Kinevsky Zatzal, and he asked his father-in-law, Rav Yashiv Zatzal, he asked them this question. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah, he, was, uh, he did okay. Yeah, yeah, Rav Zilberstein married Rav Yashiv's daughter. Uh, so he asked them, the two, the two gedole hador, what do you think they answered? What do you think they answered? Good question. What would you say, Alan? What do you say? Do they have to cancel their vacation? You shouldn't. You shouldn't. Wait, we're never allowed to go on vacation? We're never allowed to go on vacation because there's a widow living on the block? Who we happen to be, obviously, they have, they're already doing chesed because that's why she's going to miss them. That means that they're already going above and beyond by being nice to her. So now we can't go on vacation either? What do you think he said? Huh? Don't go on vacation. They didn't say don't go. Take her with. Take her with. Uh, they, 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 she's, they can't, cause she can't come with. I feel like the idea is to be like, have like a selfless mindset. Uh, yeah, you're right. You should be selfless. Are they obligated to not go on vacation? No, oh, good. So what they said, right. So what they said was, which they themselves probably knew. They were probably more asking, what should we do, not what are we allowed to do? I mean, how would you like to, to be in that situation? You're packed up and and a widow comes over to you and says, yeah, an older lady was, oh, I, w I really wish you guys wouldn't be going on vacation. The answer is what, Re what Reb Zilberstein said was, uh, what Reb Yashiv and Reb Chaim, independently, what they said is, you're not obligated not to, to, you're not obligated. But if you cancel your vacation, the next time, any time you have any sort of life difficulties, life troubles, you will be surrounded by protective angels. That's, what, that's how they put it. Now, I, you know, it's hard, but protective angels are good. <laughs> you know, so, so it's a hard thing. Listen, it's a hard thing. It's a very hard thing. But it's a, that, that, that's, a, that's what, so the Torah is telling you, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense. Okay, one more point over here. We, we, we have to start, there's one more point there I want to get to. If you take a look at Perak Chav Gimel Pasuk Hey, so it's, it's the bottom of page 432. So you see your enemy's donkey crouching under the load. Would you avoid helping him? You have an obligation to try to help him. So this is the source in the Torah of Tsar Balei Chaim. Tsar Balei Chaim means that not to cause pain to live, not to cause distress to living animals. And there's a famous, uh, 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 you know, any, any needless pain to living animals. Uh, there's a famous question that Noda B. Yehuda, who was one of the great halachic authorities in the, in the uh, 18th 
Sorry, the 18th century. So Dodibiru was asked by a very wealthy man living in Russia. He owned many, he owned forests, a very tremendous wealthy man. And he wanted to know if he's allowed to go hunting for sport. He doesn't need the animals. He doesn't need their hides. He just enjoys going out in the woods and shooting animals for sport, which is not unusual. I had a kid here from, I had a guy, I had a guy here once from Arizona. He told me that he and his father would go on vacation. They would buy 10,000 rounds of ammunition. They would drive 60, 50, or 60 miles into the, into the desert in a, in a, in a what do you call it, uh, what's it called, a, uh, a, 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 a Winnebago, what's it called, uh, like a trailer, uh, huh? Like an RV? An RV, uh, oh, yeah, like a trailer home, uh, with, on wheels, what's it called? Uh, RV, RV. Uh, RV, that's what it's called? A recreational vehicle, yeah, they, they, you know, they would stay in the, and he said they would just, for about a week, they would just be out there, they'd you know, take supplies, and they would shoot. I said, what, what did you shoot? And they're 50, 60 miles out in the desert, nobody around, nobody. Within. I said, what did you shoot? He said, anything that moved. <laughs> anything that moved. Snakes, rodents, any, anything that moved, they shot. That's what they did. That was, the, that was their sport. The people go hunting for sport. You know, I, 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 listen, I couldn't make something like that up I, if I wanted to. You know, I know people do it. So they asked, no, to be hit, are you allowed to go hunting for sport? So uh, and most people think instinctively, well, no, you know, it's Tsar Balei Chaim. And no, he didn't say that. He said, he said, by the letter of the law, the same way that you could slaughter animals for meat, and you could, you could, you could kill animals because you need to make shoes out of them. If that's a need, if it's actually a, if it's actually a need, it's not by letter of law, it's not prohibited. But he said to the guy, what does that say about you? If considering the only hunters we find in the Torah that people describe as hunters are Nimrod and Esav, uh, uh, what does it say about you if that's the way you, you enjoy yourself, that you have no other way to entertain yourself by going out and shooting animals? Right? And then he says, anyway, it's prohibited because you're putting yourself in needless danger by going into the forest where there are dangerous animals that could kill you. And that you're not allowed to do is put your life in danger for no reason and for no good reason. And therefore, he said it's prohibited. But as Tsar Balei Chaim couldn't pay, the Nodibira says, by the letter of law, it's probably not prohibited. Because, you know, if you need to hunt, a guy, let's say a guy tells you, I have a lot of nervous, my blood pressure is high. I, the only way for me to lower my blood pressure is by relaxing and shooting animals. Yeah, then it would be allowed by according to Allah, that becomes a need, no different than any other need. Right? So then that becomes a need. I, I need to make a wallet, I need to make a leather wallet, and leather shoes, you're allowed to kill an animal. Say, same thing, that becomes, a, that becomes a need. But you're not allowed to go and endanger yourself for it. And in the four Josh Russian forests where there are, where are lions and whatever else they have, they, they, what do you call it, bears or whatever else they have over there, so then you're, then you're not allowed to, uh, then you're then allowed to be decided not to. But this is the source in the Torah for Tzabra Lechaim, to cause needless pain to animals, uh, to go and torture animals, to go with needless pain to animals that you're not allowed to do, to experiment on guinea pigs, that sort of thing, where it's for a human need. So that's why it's permissible. But if it's something that's uh, just causing needless pain, that you're not allowed to do. All right, guys, have enjoy your enjoy your break.